Good morning, David, and good morning, ever, or good afternoon, depending on where you are right now. This is Breathe TV, a service of COPD Navigator here on Facebook. My name is Mike Hess. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we have recently relaunched, and we're still working out a lot of the quirks in our tech stuff. Um, a little bit of a background noise there. just realized I forgot to turn my audio off, so hopefully things are going to work okay. Uh, like I said, we haven't done quite one of these quite without any glitches yet. Um, most uh, recently, our biggest glitch over there, you see our, our in-studio artwork uh, has failed on me a little bit. Uh, right in the middle of filming one of our last uh, Spotlight episodes, so that's why we haven't seen anything about meter dose inhalers, but fret not, that is coming soon. Um, I did realize one thing I just forgot to grab, so I'm going to step off for just a second. because what would we be without notes so i have a few notes that i have to do here because uh while i am uh, as i said my a respiratory therapist and i uh, have some knowledge about copd uh, as my kids and my wife can attest uh, i am terrible without all of my reminders so i don't want to uh, forget any of the stuff that we have today if you're new to the program we do do we do this about every two weeks uh, we call it Breathe TV. We have uh, a little quick hit of some of the latest headlines in the world of COPD and chronic lung disease management. Uh, we go on for a topic of the day, and today's topic is knowing O2, know O2, trying to learn a little bit about uh, the hows, whys, and what's of supplemental oxygen use. And then uh, we wrap up with uh, your time. We have uh, time available to get your questions about COPD um, answered as accurately and as objectively as possible. We do not dispense medical advice, of course. However, we can help you get the information that you need to go back to your clinical team and say, hey, can we follow some best practice guidelines? Or, hey, I need this. Hey, can we try that? And so on and so forth. So, again, thank you, everybody, for stopping in, spending some time with us today. First up, we are going to talk about our news, and we have a new study that came out, uh, published about a week ago, um, that talks about the use of statin drugs in COPD. Now, statins have been kind of a um, controversial topic, more or less. They're, they're a topic where uh, the evidence has kind of gone back and forth about whether they may be helpful or not, and the latest round of data is actually positive again. This was a study that came out of China. Uh, who did what's called a meta-analysis. Basically what they did was, this was not a new study in and of itself, but they took a huge number of other surveys and studies and everything else uh, and kind of uh, looked for compatible things so that they could pool all of that data and make sort of this virtual study. And what they found, uh, they identified, uh, well, for, they looked to identify almost a thousand studies on COPD and uh, they out of that 988, they uh, whittled it down to 53 that were included in the final analysis for the project. That gives you some idea of the scope of uh, how difficult it is to do some of these studies because we have this whole pool of data, but some of it is so inconsistent that it's difficult to get um, compatible things. And so that delays progress and so on and so forth. However, we did look at, or they did look at these studies over the course. Uh, all these studies took place between January uh, 1990 and March 2018. Uh, they ranged anywhere from one month to 20 months of these folks taking statin drugs, and they found that uh, these drugs did, in, in fact, uh, improve what they call all-cause all mortality and COPD-related mortality. They were hoping, because statins have been used a little bit uh, in conjunction to lower your risk of heart disease, they were hoping to find some reduction in heart disease risk in the COPD population. They did not find that, but the uh, reductions in mortality were pretty significant. 28% uh, all-cause mortality, 28% uh, COPD-associated mortality, and uh, arguably even more important, they found a 16% reduction in uh, COPD exacerbations in those folks who were using statins. Um, the reason for this, you know, statins help to reduce a lot of uh, inflammatory effects on reduce the levels of some of those inflammatory markers you have in your body. Uh, and um, statins can help reduce that. We know that uh, inflammation is, uh, we know more and more that COPD is driven in a large part by inflammation. And so anything that we can do to try to reduce a lot of those inflammation uh, causes 
uh, or the, the effects um, can be very helpful. That's why we still use a lot of corticosteroids, especially inhaled corticosteroids, uh, despite some of the risks that, th that those drugs have. And so it's always nice to be able to try to find uh, an alternative, an alternative medication that maybe doesn't have quite the same risk profile, but still can be beneficial. Uh, and uh, they did find that these marker or the, these statin drugs reduced um, uh, CRP or C-reactive protein, which is a key cardiac inflammation marker, uh, a bunch of interleukins, which are often looked at in asthma, uh, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, a variety of indicators uh, show that they did have reduced inflammation. And finally, one of the last benefits was that they did uh, see better actual lung function uh, improvements in FEV1, uh, and they did see improved uh, exercise performance as measured by the six-minute walk test, which is basically a measure of how far you go in six minutes, whether you, even if you have to stop and take breaks and all that stuff. Um, a little bit back and forth how applicable that is to real world scenarios because you know, most people aren't just walking and you know, you're doing your activities of daily living and lifting your arms up and all that and that all plays a part in activity tolerance too. But this is one of those objective measures that we have and we use it because it's kind of the best we have at the moment. Some limitations of this study. Uh, the biggest one they pointed out was that uh, the, the trials themselves uh, had relatively small data sets. They had relatively small uh, people enrolled in the trials. Uh, and so the individual groups of data were not necessarily ideal. And so any, uh, any effect, negative effects of that can be magnified, positive effects of that can be magnified. And it's important that we don't make a lot of assumptions on these meta-analyses. Uh, but what this does tell us is that we do need to do a lot more. Um, we need to have a bigger individual trial that is very consistent and has a lot of these things so we can really lock down uh, if these statins are effective um, and if they are who they're effective in so that we can really tailor that treatment appropriately. Uh, second up is an interesting thing that I actually discovered um, in uh, our respiratory therapy circles. We have um, basically respiratory therapist Facebook. Uh, we call it AARC Connect. Um, and there was a post about this that I came across on there that I was very interested in. Apparently, uh, CVS, the pharmacy chain, uh, we knew uh, this was, uh, what, about a year ago maybe, they bought uh, the insurance company Aetna. National Insurance Company, and as part of their re-strategization, uh, if you like that word, um, after they acquired Aetna, is they want to reduce what they spend in their Aetna arm by trying to make people healthier. And so they're really trying to identify a lot of the barriers to health and that sort of thing. And so they're trying this new strategy called a health hub, or like kind of this mini clinic. They already have the idea of the minute clinic, but now they have these mini clinics uh, in some of their stores. They're trialing three of them down in Texas. They literally just opened. Um, basically, the idea is uh, each, uh, each of the CVS stores, the drug stores, has their pharmacy section, their usual retail section where you go buy all the other stuff that's bad for you. Um, and then they also have this health clinic where they have a, a small laboratory, they do health screenings, and apparently some of, they also have these wellness rooms that, where they can do uh, yoga, they have people come in and do yoga, um, they have access to dietitians, and they even have access to respiratory therapists. Uh, we weren't sure about that, and that's actually how it came up on the, the, the message board. But there was a, we did a little bit of digging, we did find a call for, a recruitment call for um, home care uh, respiratory therapist to come work for these uh, these three places in Texas. Um, so uh, the idea is we want to uh, reduce or improve access, reduce barriers to getting these durable medical equipment supplies, diabetic supplies, sleep apnea supplies, all that kind of stuff. Um, they want to make customers healthier, lower health care costs, all that sort of thing. Um, and they've also developed this idea of what they're calling a health concierge, which is uh, they're in the store and they're trying to uh, help um, the patients navigate uh, through these, this new format and uh, get, a lot, get better access to a lot of these services. And uh, one of the things that I'm fairly passionate about is care coordination. And uh, that's, again, a big component of these concierge, health concierge folks. Um, there was a quote from uh, the CVS Executive Vice President of Transformation named uh, Alan Lotvin. Uh, in one instance, a person came into CVS and told the pharmacist they had just been diagnosed with prediabetes or elevated blood sugar that's on the cusp of diabetes. 
Uh, the pharmacist then told them that prediabetes is uh, reversible through diet and exercise, or at least modifiable. Um, and then they walk that person right over to, to an in-store dietitian for consultation. So the idea of this is fantastic. Uh, having that kind of one-stop shop that isn't, you don't necessarily have to have an appointment. You don't have to go through all the usual hoops that you run through in your usual provider's office, um, especially for things where you just kind of need a touch up or you need a little bit of a touch point. You need a little bit of reinforcement like inhaler technique, for example, um, and all that stuff. Um, and so they've got three of these health hubs specifically in the Houston area, uh, just opened uh, sometime in December. They're planning on using these uh, locations to test a variety of services. They're not sure that every service is going to roll out to every CS, uh, CVS, uh, but they do want to kind of pick and choose what's most effective and what's most efficient uh, and uh, deliver that to uh, where that uh, is going to do the most good. They are expecting to have focus groups uh, in the coming weeks to help determine uh, what's working and what isn't. So if you happen to be in the Houston area, uh, check out the CVS website, uh, which is actually on the links. I'll figure out how to point sooner or later. Uh, that link gets you to the Health Hub website and gives you the location of those three health hubs. I'm not affiliated with CVS, but I am desperately curious uh, to find out what your thoughts on it are. Uh, and also, if you don't mind, help us advocate for respiratory therapists. This is uh, one of the things that I fight for professionally a lot is these new opportunities. We can play a huge role in uh, the outpatient space uh, and try to get people connected with the resources they need, the, in the inhaler technique training they need, the spirometry they need, all that sort of thing. Uh, but we need venues like this in order to do that. So help us out a little bit. Uh, on the same note as some of these non-traditional settings and non-traditional services and all that, um, another interesting thing I came across is um, there apparently is uh, an app in development to do some pulmonary rehab in the home. Uh, we in the States know that uh, access to pulmonary rehab is very difficult in many cases. Uh, people don't have access, uh, literal access to a lot of programs, and even when those programs are available, um, there are logistical problems. You have to haul tanks around, or you have to get rides, you have to do all that kind of stuff, and it's difficult. Um, that's one of the biggest barriers. I think we talked about that a couple weeks ago when we were doing our COPD 101 class. Um, if we can get people to do pulmonary rehab in the home, uh, it's probably going to go a little bit better. And so this group called Kaya Health has designed uh, an app to do in-home pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, they released a study uh, the, toward the end of last year, um, which I don't think, uh, that's not the one I linked to. This uh, uh, links to the article that i um, uh, kind of getting some of the overall uh, idea from. Um, they did this thing in Germany. Um, they did a, developed a 20-day core pulmonary rehabilitation program and uh, put it into an app, got it actually approved as a medical device, so they were able to disseminate it through the clinical channels and all that. Uh, they found that 61% um, of the people who uh, downloaded the app and actually qualified and weren't just like curious folks or whatever, um, completed the the 20 day session within 40 days they they uh, the average completion rate was about uh 20 or 33 days and they said plus or minus 11 so anywhere from 22 days to 44 days these folks did 20 days of pulmonary rehab exercises and stuff 61 percent is remarkable if you talk to uh i'm not a specialist in pulmonary rehab but i'm kind of pulmonary rehab adjacent I know a lot of people who are involved in it, and I know a lot of the stats because we're trying to improve access for that as, a, as an advocacy tool. Um, and 61% completion is amazing. Um, and not only was it amazing, not only were people doing it, but it did seem to work. Uh, they noticed statistically and clinically uh, significant improvements in their COPD assessment test score, the CAT, which is a pretty well-known standardized uh, COPD evaluation test. We use it in our clinic. Um, they also found uh, clinical improvements, clinically significant improvements using the Chronic Respiratory Disease Questionnaire, or CRQ. They found those in the domains of fatigue, uh, emotional function, and what they call mastery, which is kind of feeling in control of your disease process. So we might know it better as self-efficacy or just being able to control what's going on and not that feeling of powerlessness and helplessness and all that. Um, and they also did find, uh, it said statistically, but not clinically significant improvements in dyspnea or those feelings of shortness of breath. So there were a lot of uh, important 
uh, improvements again just in 20 days and not only is it just in 20 days but the fact is if you can do this in your home uh, right now in the u.s we're limited to about a 12-week supply of pulmonary rehab if you can even get it and afford it and everything else um, you can keep on doing it and we know that if you keep on doing pulmonary rehab you keep those benefits and if you stop they go away so this is going to help a lot of people get involved and stay involved and do a huge thing for uh, healthcare down the road um, also clinically significant benefits in their healthcare quality of life scores um, content uh, so how does it work uh, it addresses physical and psychological factors of the disease uh, which is fantastic we usually a lot of times we focus on some of the clinical things to help you breathe better and we forget about the uh, anxiety depression isolation frustration stress all of those things that go along with any chronic disease but particularly one that makes you not breathe very well uh, content is based on clinically validated patient guidelines and allows users to better self-manage their symptoms so again we're talking about that self-efficacy uh, includes video-based physiotherapy, exercises that help patients build muscle, promote a healthy cardiovascular system, whilst uh, a training algorithm adjusts the support based on each patient's disease profile and feedback. There's some mention of artificial intelligence guiding the way there. Um, and uh, very importantly, they also have psychological, psychosocial support uh, provided through audio-based relaxation exercises uh, to manage anxiety and depression to help cope with symptom flares, dyspnea attacks, all that sort of thing. Um, patients can contact a coach via the app uh, so they can actually talk to a real human, not just the artificial intelligence. Uh, who will answer app specific questions and work with users on their individual goals and offer motivation because sometimes you just need somebody to tell you it's okay we're here for you and you're doing all right um, breathing techniques coughing techniques nutrition advice uh, air pollution alerts uh, medication reminders video instructions to do inhaler technique which uh, blows my mind that's fantastic and that probably goes I, I would hazard a guess, and this is not anti-pulmonary rehab at all, but that a big chunk of what they see in some of their healthcare-related quality of life improvement comes from just knowing how to use the dang inhalers. Uh, that's been my experience clinically, and then because once you can use the inhalers, then you can actually move around and do the exercises. So all of it working together, it's fantastic. Um, this is a, again a company that uh, is in Germany. They're doing this study now in Japan to validate it there. They're looking at expanding into the states right now. They're doing something called the Perfect Squat Challenge, uh, which is an app that's available. But right now, the COPD app um, is only available in German-speaking countries. It said I did fill out a, a request for more information form on their website this morning. So hopefully, I can get a little bit more info, take a peek at it, and let you know uh, what the deal is. All right, so that is our news thing, and I want to say hello to uh, the two Angelas watching this morning on snowy days uh, across the country. Um, I saw them this morning. Um, it's a snow day in Washington, D.C. Governmental offices are closed down there. Um, I suspect uh, one might argue that that's an improvement on things, but um, not to get too political. Um uh, We've got snow days all over the all over the country right now. Here in Michigan, we've uh, we're just getting over snow days. We've got a little bit of freezing snow, freezing rain today. Um, we've still digging out on all that stuff. So hopefully, you guys have been able to stay healthy, stay well. Uh, Pauline also checking in. Anything which makes it easier for people to get health care has to be a good thing wherever in the world. Wholeheartedly agree. And um, that's why a lot of these things like enhanced clinics and apps and all that stuff. Um, are so important and why we need to uh, get the word out, uh, promote them, and um, make sure that people are getting those opportunities. Uh, also going to say, take a moment and say hello to David. David's been a longtime member of our Facebook group, uh, COPD Navigator. If you want access to a variety of respiratory therapists and other uh, experts, as well as people walking the path, get that peer interview going, search us up on Facebook, COPD Navigator. Um, you'll get a page that has a lighthouse, in the, uh, and then you'll also get the group. Um, Fantastic benefits. Of course, I'm a little bit biased at being the administrator there, but I hope you come and join us. Uh, also, Lisa checking in from Alaska all the way across uh, the continent. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, as we get into the meat and potatoes of today's session, we are going to be talking about oxygen. Oxygen, of course, is something that surrounds us. 
Um, and the words of Obi Obi-Wan Kenobi, it surrounds us, it binds us, it makes our lives possible, everything else. But we kind of take it for granted. We don't think about it a whole lot until it's not there. Yet it is one of the most important things that we do, particularly with folks who have a little bit more severe COPD. So we're going to talk a little bit about why that works, how it works, all that sort of thing. We'll go way back to the beginning, a couple of centuries ago, to this gentleman on your screen here by the name of Joseph Priestley. Um, widely accepted, not necessarily definitively declared, but widely accepted to be um, the discoverer of the oxygen molecule. He had this thing... Um, basically, he was an experimenter, he was a scientist, and so he took this sample of mercury oxide, heated it up, I understand, with uh, focused sunlight. Um, so I guess maybe he was like a five-year-old at heart. Um, heated this, this stuff up and noticed that it was producing this gas. He saw, somehow he saw, he was able to measure this produced gas. And he, um, he noticed that fire seemed to burn better. He somehow loaded it up uh, with mice, gave mice, had mice breathe this air, and he said that he felt they were more active uh, and they seemed to live a little bit longer. And then, of course, being the responsible scientist he was, he decided to breathe some of it himself and see what would happen. And he said that he didn't really notice a lot of um, 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 physical benefit or, you know, he didn't notice a lot of benefit, but he did seem that it did seem like his chest was lighter, I think is how he put it. And so um, he called this thing uh, deflagisticated, uh, I think I said that right, deflagisticated air because uh, we didn't really know how combustion worked real well back in the day. Um, and they thought that this was a component that, that this phlogiston had been taken out of and helped things burn a little bit better. We now know um, that that is, let me see if I put the, I can't remember if I put the oxygen molecule on there or not. We, oh, well, close enough. Um, we know that um, oxygen is now is not actually just a, a sub it's a subcomponent of air. It's not a form of air. Uh, it actually makes up all the stuff that's around us. It makes up about 21% of the oxygen molecules that surround you. Um, it does not necessarily make up 21% of the volume because uh, if you think back to good old chemistry class back in the day, um, as you lower pressure, volume expands. And so if you're on the top of Mount Everest, 21% um, of the molecules are much farther apart and there are much fewer of them as if you were down at sea level. Uh, and so that's why a lot of times oxygen demands can be a little bit different if you're at relatively lower al altitudes. Uh, and even when you get up, you know, even people with perfectly healthy lungs who are climbing those mountains like Everest still need some of that supplemental oxygen. We see here that your body uh, takes in oxygen. This is kind of an animation of a close-up of the little air sacs inside your lungs that are called alveoli. Uh, when you take a breath in, oxygen flows in uh, with the rest of the air that you're taking in and through the magic, again, of chemistry, which we're not going to dive too deeply into. Uh, I'm sure Khan Academy or somebody else can do it a lot better than I can. Uh, but the, the moral of the story is the oxygen goes into the blood, the carbon dioxide comes out, and that is basically how you're filling uh, your main one of your main cellular fuel tanks. Uh, of course, we all think of food and stuff like that as our main fuel, but your cells do need oxygen in order to operate. Uh, and so when you have issues interrupting the this oxygen flow, the, this molecular oxygen flow, then you start having a bad day. And of course, we know in COPD, a couple of graphics from uh, that COPD 101 course, the two major components of COPD are the chronic bronchitis element, where you have kind of that, uh, that mucus hypersecretion. Uh, you have a lot of extra phlegm, junk, uh, whatever you want to call it, in your chest, which uh, can physically block oxygen from getting there. You also have that irritation where you get that inflammation again um, that makes the airway smaller, makes it more difficult for oxygen to get in. And then you have the concepts uh, involved in emphysema where you actually have this tissue breakdown. Instead of a whole bunch of little sacs, you have one big one. And although it may be bigger, again, in volume, the surface area is uh, much less than having the little small grapes in there. And so when you have less space for the oxygen to transfer across or diffuse across, then um, less of it is going to get into your bloodstream and less of it is going to get delivered to the tissues. 
And that's why oftentimes we have to supplement that oxygen. Again, if you're perfectly healthy and that sort of thing, if you go way up, uh, that's why they have to pressurize airplane cabins and why you have to have tanks with you when you go on Mount Everest and all that sort of thing. But sometimes that happens to folks down here at ground level too when they have uh, similar barriers to uh, oxygenation. Uh, so, uh, let's see how the slideshow is working here. Not working real well, I guess. Okay, so we have uh, two things here. First off, we have uh, how we supply people with their oxygen, and this is uh, um, this is an oxygen concentrator. On the the left side of your screen, right here, you're seeing um, the oxygen concentrator. I actually have in my office right now. Um, I, my room does not have piped in oxygen, so when I have folks come in to see me, um, I actually uh, um, we we're able to get a portable concent or a stationary concentrator um, to generate the air. And how the, this equipment works is actually really cool. It basically just sucks in oxygen, uh, the whole, the air, all the air, not just the oxygen. Um, does again a lot of uh, pumping and, and chilling and things like that, and actually puts them through molecular filters uh, so that our the oxygen is able to kind of get filtered out of it and everything else is blocked, and then it gets compressed. It sucked, it gets sucked in, gets compressed. Uh, and then that's what comes out of the outlet tube that's connected to your cannula that goes into your nose. This is a fantastic device for people in the home um, who need that supplemental oxygen because it's, um, believe it or not, um, we'll talk relatives here, of course, but it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's relatively simple to do, simple to use, all that sort of thing. Um, you kind of, you get it, you plug it in, you turn it on, it's good to go. The downside to a device like this is it is relatively noisy, as you can imagine, with a pump and a compressor and motors and all that kind of thing. It does make a fair bit of noise. Um, I understand it kind of turns into sort of a white noise situation. You do get used to it, but it still can be bothersome. Um, they're bulky. That one, you know, you can you can't really get a sense of it from looking at it. But that one in my office probably comes up to about my knee, and it is not light whatsoever. Uh, and of course, you don't quite get pure oxygen out of this device. Um, I, this is a, a fairly new graphic. It's going to depend a lot on um, exactly the manufacturer and exactly their equipment and, and all kinds of, there's a lot of variables involved there. I think 90% is probably a little bit on the low side for a modern concentrator in good working order. It's probably going to be closer to the 95 to even uh, some of the newer ones, even 97, 98%, but it is not quite pure oxygen. And why that's really important, uh, and that's the other thing I forgot to do today, I was gonna try to illustrate this, but um, why that's really important is when you have the supplemental oxygen in your nose anyway, you're also not getting pure oxygen. You're getting a certain amount of oxygen that's delivered. You, everybody talks about the liters per minute, two liters per minute, three liters per minute, five liters per minute. That's going in, but you're also still drawing in all the other air around you, uh, which is, you know, again, only 21% oxygen. So there's kind of a dilution factor if you think about um, putting a one drop of food coloring into a glass of water. It's there but you might need to put more and more uh, food coloring in there to get it to where you want to be. And that's why we sometimes have to adjust those levels um, on home oxygen equipment, particularly the, these uh, continuous flow concentrators. So, uh, now, what are we, now what's going on? So I mentioned the word continuous flow, and that's something that we really uh, often overlook when we're talking about concentrators and stuff. I know what happened. We're supposed to have a picture of some portable tanks. Oh, there they are. They just got out of order here. So in order to get that pure oxygen or to have mobility so that you're not plugged into the wall, you um, were usually giving people these things. You probably have seen these uh, on a cart or in a shoulder bag. They come in a variety of sizes. These are uh, tanks of compressed oxygen. It is generally, uh, well, it is pure. It is medical grade, uh, pure oxygen um, that you then... You use the same way that you're using the concentrator. You have your cannula, you have your, um, you're connected to one end, you set your leader flow, and again, you're in uh, what we call in training or taking in some of that oxygen in addition to um, everything else that's surrounding you. 
it's not pure oxygen unless we set you up on a delivery system that um, actually can uh, overpower your inspiratory flow um, because when you breathe in more than the demand is you uh, because again of physics we'll go back instead of high school chemistry we'll go back to high school physics class you suck in everything else in addition to what you're trying to get in uh, if we put you on a uh, what we call a high flow system or you know you may if you've had an exacerbation you have to go into the emergency room sometimes you get that little mask with the bag on it called a non rebreather mask those pieces of equipment are able to overcome uh, the demand to the point where all you're getting pretty much is just the oxygen but that's a little bit uh, a little bit more complicated than we need to because you hopefully won't run into that unless you're actually having a bad day in which case uh, we haven't done our jobs in the outpatient world so getting back to the the uh, concentrators a little bit we do have this idea of these portable concentrators because a lot of people like that instead of a tank they have uh, f um, certain disadvantages, certain advantages. A lot of times people consider them to be a little bit more uh, long lasting, and that's certainly true. But you also have to remember that instead of being limited just by a tank, these are not indefinite things. They're still a motor, they're still run by electricity. You have to carry around batteries. And whenever you have to carry around more batteries, there's this trade off with weight and size and everything else. Um, and the other thing is that most of the portable concentrators do not actually provide uh, a continuous flow of oxygen. And we also see that in the tank world because we have these regulating devices, these pulse dose regulators, where we try to make things last as long as possible. Uh, so instead of having things blow at you continuously, even when you're exhaling and not getting any of it in, there's a pressure sensor that when you start taking a breath in, it gives you a little puff of air or of oxygen. And again, these can work great, but the problem is there's not a lot of consistency, especially with uh, the portable oxygen concentrators as to how big that dose is and what triggers the change in size. Um, a lot of times these portable concentrators will have numbers on them, just like a home concentrator where you'll, you'll see one, two, three, four. Uh, whereas on a home concentrator, that will be the continuous liter flow, one liter per minute, two liters per minute, etc. But on these devices, it's basically just, it, it's like turning up the volume on your radio. It depends on what model you have. Um, a Sony 5 isn't necessarily a um, um, uh, Anchor 5. Um, and from concentrator to concentrator, that varies. And the other thing to remember is when you're taking a breath in, you're getting that, that dose, but if you're taking a bigger breath, you're still getting that same fixed dose. Let's say it's 150 milliliters. It's 150 milliliters whether you're taking a 500 milliliter breath or you're taking a 200 milliliter breath. So obviously if you're only taking a 200 milliliter breath, 150 of it's going to be oxygen and 50 is going to be the other stuff, and that's pretty high oxygen. That's probably good. If you're taking a 500 liter or milliliter breath, much less of that is oxygen and it might not fit your needs and so it's really important when you're doing a pulse dose system whether it's a regulator or a concentrator or what have you you kind of take it for a test drive uh, when you're able to get it hopefully you're able to get it from your, your medical equipment provider you've got to try it out a little bit as you're walking as you're doing some of these activities to make sure it's going to fit your needs because there are a lot of people out there who get kind of sold on these because they see a fancy commercial I'm not going to name any names because I'm not sponsored by anybody, um, but they see a fancy commercial and think this device is going to be the answer to all of their problems and help them uh, go out and um, uh, run with the grandkids and do all that kind of things. And that might not be the right device for them or their particular uh, uh, condition, state of symptoms and, and all that stuff. So it's important to test this stuff out before you get too far down the road of, of owning it and uh, all that stuff. So. As a matter of fact, I was able to track down this chart here from a magazine called RT Magazine. The chart itself is about 10 years old, but the concepts are, are pretty much identical where you can see the faster you breathe and the more air you're moving, the less relative amount of oxygen you have. And that's true whether it's continuous flow, which is that white line, or they looked at about eight, eight different kinds of, of um, uh, different um, pulse doses. Uh, and they found that pretty con continuously, except for that uh, couple of oddballs there, the faster you breathe, the less oxygen you're actually getting. And usually, the faster you're breathing, the more important it is to get more oxygen because you're either having bad symptoms or you're exerting yourself or, you know, whatever it is. So, 
again, the right piece of equipment, just like with medications, the right med, the right device for the right person, the right oxygen delivery per system for the right person in the right setting. So how do we figure out how we're going to use our device? How much oxygen we need? How do you, count, you know, what, what is it? Is it enough? Is it too much? All that sort of thing. Um, what I will say uh, first off is this device right here is kind of a, a blessing and a curse for a variety of reasons. This is a pulse oximeter. This is a fingertip pulse oximeter. Uh, this is one I use pretty frequently. Again, not sponsored by any of these equipment companies. Basically, it goes on your finger. And uh, if you can, let me see if I can get this on camera a little bit here. If you look inside there, and yep, you should be able to see that little red light there. And what that little red light does is it actually shines through your finger when it's on. And based on what wavelengths of light make it through the blood in the, your fingertip, um, there's a sensor on the flip side that is able to process that image, process those wavelengths, and figure out exactly how much um, of your hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen, how much of it is carrying oxygen in your arteries. And that's, uh, that's important because that's a, a rough, easy, non-invasive, you don't have to do any kind of, of uh, blood draw or anything like that. This is a very quick way to figure out your general um, oxygen state for a lot of people. Um, it's pretty cool because you get, uh, you can get a variety of, um, I'm going to clear off a couple of things here. I'm able actually to synchronize this with uh, my phone. You can do it over Bluetooth. Uh, you can get a, a readout of, whoop, there goes my finger there. Um, you can get a readout of how good your pulse is. You get your pulse rate. You get a, a value that kind of helps evaluate uh, whether you should trust this signal or not. Um, you can even do some trending. This is a really helpful setup for when we're doing um, home oxygen evaluations because what the usual criteria is to get people on home oxygen is this number here, and I probably should have picked a different finger. This number here that is currently reading 97, except no, there we go, 96, 97. That number has to be below 88% in most cases. If you have some cardiac things going on, it can be below 90, but most uh, coverage guidelines, particularly through American Medicare, uh, tell us that you have to be 88% or lower. If you have 88% or lower at rest, then you get oxygen all the time. Uh, if you're 88% only when you're walking, exerting yourself, there's a uh, um, measurement for, or there's a prescription just for uh, with activity. Um, we can kind of tailor that a little bit to uh, individuals' demands or, or requirements and that sort of thing. Uh, but usually the, the cutoff is we use that, that uh, pulse oximetry. Um, some controversy surrounding that first off first and foremost probably the biggest controversy that's going on right now is uh, a little um boy a couple of years ago now uh, in the new england journal of medicine there was a big study about supplemental oxygen because they wanted to see if people who didn't quite hit that who were still low but weren't quite 88 percent low could still benefit from supplemental oxygen and we've talked about that a couple of times on our older show uh, navigator live and we talk about it in the group um, the study is controversial for a lot of a lot of concerns. There were concerns about recruitment and retention and how they were measuring some of this stuff. But uh, basically what it said was it, it confirmed that unless you were 88 or below, um, you're not really getting a lot of benefit from that oxygen. Um, again, it, it's got to be a little bit more individualized than that. Uh, that's an excellent general guideline, but um, we need to be concerned about um, how we're actually measuring that. The other thing is we can get a little bit too reliant on pulse oximetry. Um, a lot of times we will look at that value and take it as you know, the absolute thing we've got to focus on. We've got to fix that. We've got to be laser focused on that. And we forget one of the things that, at least one of the first things I learned in respiratory school was to treat your patient, treat the person under your care, not the number. Pulse oxes will lie to you. You have to be able to understand when to trust that value and when not to. And that's why sometimes with some of the less expensive pulse oximeters that just give you a number, they can be a little less reliable because they're kind of designed to give you a number no matter what. 
these more expensive clinical grade ones that can give you a pulse waveform so that you can actually see that you're getting a pulse, that you're seeing um, that it's actually measuring something, uh, can give you a little bit of a quality control measure. Those are going to be a little bit more helpful uh, as you're working on your own oxygen plans and as we're figuring out, um, as we're making clinical decisions about who can benefit the most from oxygen. Um, another thing we need to worry about in, uh, we, we talk a lot about, especially with pulse oximetry, um, and this is, uh, uh, I'm a little bit worried, uh, because I'm a little bit concerned. One of my friends is watching, uh, we had a, a con um, uh, we didn't have a debate, but there was a joke about this whole idea of the hypoxic drive, and they were saying that they didn't want to hear anything about hypoxic drive today because they were already stressed out enough. So, there is this theory out there in healthcare based on a paper that was written, I want to say 40 years ago, uh, somewhere in that ballpark, decades, we'll call it decades ago, that looked at six people with chronic lung disease. And they found that in most of those six people, if they had too much oxygen, they would stop breathing. They would lose their, their ability or their desire to breathe, and they would kind of then go into this unconsciousness and fall into a coma and have, again, a really bad day. And on the strength of those six odd patients or so, this whole idea of the hypoxic drive theory came to be where it says if you have chronically low oxygen levels, as many people with COPD have because of those barriers and getting stuff to where it needs to go, you shouldn't ever give them too much oxygen because they, instead of having this drive to breathe based on low oxygen, they've become adapted to that. And now they're only based uh, on... Um, or excuse me, I, a, little bit, a little bit backwards here because I'm all hyped up about it. People with COPD have chronically high carbon dioxide levels. And so usually the mechanism to drive is elevated carbon dioxide. But if you become acclimated to that and you start taking your, your, this hypoxic drive starts taking over where instead of high uh, CO2 levels, it's low oxygen. When your oxygen drops to a certain level, that's what kicks in your sensation to breathe. And of course, if you give those folks supplemental oxygen, you're never going to let them drop, uh, drop to that level. They're never going to get triggered to breathe, uh, and therefore they're going to fall into these comas and die and all that sort of thing. And again, the basis of six people that has never been replicated, never been duplicated, anything like that. So there's this constant thing that is taught as gospel in respiratory school, nursing school, medical school, all over the place. And we talk about it all the time, and we see people who, uh, well, uh, Mr. Jones was 92%, uh, so I took his oxygen off even though his respiratory rate is in the 30s. You know, he's huffing and puffing, but we can't turn his oxygen up because he's a COPD person. And so we really need to get away from that. We need to recognize that the hypoxic drive it's not really a drive we need to look at it more as sort of an allergy or you know a drug reaction or something like that just like some people um can have peanut butter and be perfectly fine some people have peanut butter and go into this anaphylactic reaction or bee stings or what have you um, it does happen on very rare occasions but usually the things that are causing some of the other clinical symptoms are related to the other factors of an exacerbation. If you're tired from having to struggle to breathe and you're finally able to relax a little bit, yeah, you're going to relax and get tired and maybe take a nap for a little while. So we need to be very careful about monitoring. We need to be very careful about um, making sure that people are getting the right doses of stuff. Um, but we also need to not overreact and do this one size fits none solution that um, a lot of times we kind of get into the, the the way we've always done it and that's kind of the tradition and we need to get away from that is the bottom line. Um, one, I'll get back to a, a couple of these things. I want to address a couple of comments that just popped up. Um, uh, David tells us he's got a, a similar phone where uh, transfers all the data to the phone, then can show it to the provider, the doc. Um, I like to use provider because we got a lot of NPs and PAs out there and uh, um, love all my clinical partners. But you go talk to your, your provider and you see where your O2 has been all over the week. And that's fantastic. That's the kind of data that helps us in the clinical world uh, make better decisions because then that's how it's easier to notice trends. If you're in a certain place, your oxygen drops or you always have to use your rescue inhaler. Um, at certain times of day, certain, you know, even if we, if we expand it out, days of the week, months of the year, we can look at seasonal changes. We 
are I'm hopeful in this era of technology and connectivity and everything else that we can start using some of this data to make more personalized medicine. So that is excellent. Um, treating the numbers less excellent. Uh, again, uh, this is not to say that if you're 85%, uh, you, you, we shouldn't we should just blow it off and say, ah, walk it off, rub some dirt on it. But if you're 88%, you're feeling perfectly fine and you're pink and healthy and not short of breath, we need to not panic either. We need to look at, um, you know, is, is the sensor on you? Know, I've had, uh, there are people, stories float around all the time. Yeah, I had this emergency call because this person's pulse ox was 75 and you get to the room and it's actually taking the, the pulse ox reading of their sheet or something like that. You know, we have to make sure that we're understanding the context of those numbers and not just treating that. Everybody's got a little bit different normal and we've got to uh, compensate for that too. So uh, Gage, uh, RT friend of mine, talks about same for ABG, learn the same thing. Um, 100% sure what we're talking about there. There is a way to qualify for oxygen with arterial blood gases. Um, and um, so I don't know where exactly we're going with that, but uh, I'm learning all that kind of stuff. So, so thank you. <laughs> Glad I didn't disappoint anybody talking about hypoxic drive today. Um, David uh, even allows to add notes uh, to it as well. That Again, that's fantastic. I believe on this particular app, uh, again, this is from a company, again, not sponsored or anything, called uh, Massimo. Um, let's see, I believe I can. Can I add a note on here? Um, I don't know if I can or not, but this is the, the clinical version of it. Um, there is a home care version of it that, um, especially, you know, the, the same device, as a matter of fact, I believe, uh, it just hasn't been certified um, as an FDA compliant medical device. So that is makes it less expensive. Um, still not terribly cheap. Um, you can get oximeters in the, you know, 10, 20, 30 dollar range, and they usually work okay. Um, but you do have to be careful, especially when they have adverse conditions, which is usually when you need them the most, when you're struggling, when they're trying to find a signal, all that kind of stuff. So um, depending on how, uh, how tightly you want to watch that, it's usually worth spending a little bit of extra bucks to get the good stuff. It's one of those get what you pay for kind of situations. Um, so. Oh, talking about treating the number, the patient, not the numbers. Excellent. It's kind of, you know, and it's not specific to RTs either. I'm glad to know that that's not going away. That is a critical thing that we need to, to keep focused on. Um, I, I've soapboxed it on this many a time. We need to remember that not only is it not just a number, it's not just a patient, it is actually a person. And we need to make sure that we are focusing on the person and their needs as we are uh, developing these treatment plans and management plans and everything else going on. Um, but I don't want to soapbox too much on that because I'm sure that will come up in another day. Oh, all right, so here, um, moving on a little bit, we t also talk a lot about, I get uh, many times people will ask me, well, I'm short of breath, but my oxygen is fine. How can I be short of breath if my oxygen is fine? Or conversely, my oxygen, less commonly, but well, my oxygen is very low, um, but I'm not short of breath. And, and so, you know, how does that stuff work? And we need to remember that oxygen and shortness of breath are kind of two different mechanisms. They can influence each other, but they don't necessarily influence each other 100%. And in order to understand why, I'm going to throw back a little bit to a um, uh, recording I did for some of our medical students. Because we need to look at the whole oxygen delivery system as this set of boxcars, basically. So you see here, I'm drawing on the whiteboard, um, the oxygen train, uh, uh, which is basically your circulatory system, pulls into the, uh, uh, the lungs, lung station, I called it, and picks up its load of oxygen molecules so that it can go out uh, and uh, go all the way down the circulatory railway and deliver its vital load of life-giving oxygen to um, all of your various cells that are in your various organ systems. We see here fantastic artwork uh, depicting the various cells in your body, making up your organ systems, and then the oxygen cargo train offloading it. We also need to recognize that we actually have four different ways that the oxygen system can break down. And they all have kind of different ramifications and different um, treatment situations, different ways to treat it, different ways to compensate for it. 
The first one that I talk about here is uh, formally called the histotoxic uh, hypoxia situation. And what this means, if we break it down into, into its uh, Greek or Latin or whatever roots, uh, histo usually relates to cells. Toxic is pretty commonly accepted to mean poison, toxins, all that kind of stuff. And what we see is there's a problem in the cell where they have some kind of poisoning and they are not requiring more oxygen. And so when they're not requiring it, it's not able to offload and you have this local area of low oxygen levels. Not terribly common and so we're not going to focus on that too much. Second one we talk about here is the idea of what we call stagnant or hypoperfusion um, hypoxia. And this is where we come into where there's you're getting everything loaded onto the train okay, but then there's maybe a branch across the tracks and the train can't move. We see this a lot like if you have a blood clot or something like that. We can't deliver that oxygen to a particular part of the body, and that's why there's a problem. So we have these, sometimes you have that blood clot in your brain that causes a stroke because part of your brain isn't getting oxygen. Um, that's a sign of a heart attack where oxygen isn't getting where it needs to into the heart, and part of the heart is dying. Your cells will start dying fairly soon after they're cut off from oxygen. In many, or if, in many cases. So, um, but sometimes we don't necessarily have a blockage. It's not necessarily a clot, but we still have this stagnation. We don't have the delivery because there's a problem with our engine. Um, in this analogy, your heart is the engine of your, circu of your circulatory system, obviously, but your heart of the oxygen delivery railway. And if there's a problem with your heart, if it's not pumping enough, if it's not pumping effectively, then the oxygen isn't getting to where it needs to go. You start feeling the, the effects of that and you tell it you want to start breathing more. And that generates this sensation of shortness of breath. And again, not necessarily a, a problem with the amount of oxygen getting into the system, not a, a, the uh, staying in the blood or any of that stuff. It's just not getting where it needs to go. And so adding more oxygen, increasing that saturation, so to speak, um, isn't going to do much because you can put pure oxygen in there. And if it can't go anywhere, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to help. Um, so the third one here, as I'm erasing one of these boxcars, which represent the hemoglobin cells, is that you just don't have enough hemoglobin, so you don't have enough boxcars, so you're not able to carry enough oxygen to where it needs to go. Enough of it can get in through the lungs, there's enough of it available, but it's like having a, back, a backlog at a checkpoint. You can't get it to where it needs to go. So again, those tissues don't really care so much why the oxygen is low, uh, why there's not enough oxygen being delivered. They just care that there's not enough and they want you to breathe more so that, you know, they tell the conductor, well, you know, let's get a move on, chief. Um, let's get that stuff pumping. So, uh, and again, adding more oxygen to the system isn't really going to help. We need to fix the anemia. We need to get more boxcars going. We need to figure out how to resolve that situation. And so uh, that should take us, if I remember the video correctly, that should take us to the fourth and uh, perhaps most relevant form of hypoxia for our discussion today. And that is what we call um, hypoxic hypoxia, or perhaps more accurately, transfer hypoxia. This is where there is actually a problem with the supply line getting the oxygen from the air into the boxcars and out to the organs. Uh, and this is where the supplemental oxygen comes into play. When you don't have enough of a supply, when you're not able to get enough across that barrier, if you think back to that, that animation we saw earlier, that uh, those oxygen molecules getting from the inside the alveoli into the bloodstream, if you can't cross that barrier, then they're not going to load up and they're not going to get to where they need to go. We see sometimes that barrier gets thickened, as in um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial type of lung diseases. But we also see that in COPD, when those alveoli are covered in gunk and the oxygen can't get through, or when there aren't enough alveoli. Um, and so the, that, that uh, transfer, that diffusion, whatever we want to call it, um, breaks down. That's what we can fix to a certain degree. Because, again, thinking back to chemistry, if you increase the amount of concentration on one side of an equation, it's usually going to push through to make sure the other side is in equilibrium. And so since our lungs work the same way, low, uh, low oxygen um, uh, blood kind of pulls that, you know, helps that oxygen transfer across that boundary. If we make it easier to push it across, then it's going to help get into the blood and deliver and we're back to being in a, in a fairly happy state. 
And so that's why we use supplemental oxygen uh, in a lot of lung diseases, but particularly with COPD, because we just need to give more oomph uh, into the delivery system and again, kind of fix that supply chain a little bit. And where this all comes into pulse oximetry, your pulse oximeter only measures how full your box cars are. Doesn't matter, uh, doesn't measure how many box cars there are. It doesn't matter how fast they're being pumped out. It doesn't matter how much the cells are using the, the, the oxygen. It only measures how full they are. And so if you have, and then it comes back down to math. If you have 10 box cars that are 100% full, uh, and let's say they each hold 10, um, then you're delivering 100 units of oxygen. But if you only have five box cars, even if they're still 100% full, you're only delivering five units of oxygen. So you're having a much lower effective delivery um, that isn't going to get fi fixed with more oxygen because the box cars are full. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Um, it's an analogy we've talked about a couple of times, trying to refine it a little bit each time. Um, hopefully it came across fairly well as we're doing this stuff live here. Um, of course, we can throw that video up or we can get the, a similar video together uh, and try to keep it up for review and that sort of thing as time goes on. Uh, but again, that's why you can be short of breath even with good saturation because you might have another problem with that train, with the tracks or, or what have you. So, um, again, the biggest lesson here is if you need the oxygen, you've got to be using it too. Supplemental oxygen is there for you. Again, we mentioned that if you don't have enough oxygen to your tissues, stuff starts to die. And then we start having problems. It can happen very rapidly, urgently, as in a heart attack or a stroke, or it can happen over time and increase your risk of those things as all of your organ systems have to work harder. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people, um, as with many other aspects of COPD and smoking and other chronic diseases, we see a big stigma out there. People don't like to carry their oxygen around because, uh, first of all, it, it's burdensome. They're heavy. It, it, nobody likes to be encumbered like that. But also, it can be frustrating when people are, you know, they look at you, you're obviously sick if you have oxygen on. There's something wrong with you. And hopefully we can get away from that by increasing some of the acceptance of seeing people out there with their cannulas, seeing people out there with their oxygen, because it doesn't mean that there's something bad about you. It doesn't mean there's something wrong about you. Um, any more than wearing glasses means that there's something wrong with me other than my eyes don't work like they should. Fact of the matter is, if you need oxygen, your lungs just don't work quite like they should. And that's okay. I mean, that, that's, that's part of being human. We all have stuff that doesn't work as good as it should, unless you're you know, Mr. Universe or Mrs. Universe. So um, a little while back, longtime supporter of, of not only uh, COPD Navigator, but a um, variety of COPD advocacy initiatives by the name of, of uh, Jim Nelson and his wife and caregiver, Mary Nelson, came up with this idea of a thumbs up campaign, where if you see folks wearing their oxygen out and about, um, as they hopefully should, um, you give them a thumbs up just to recognize that, yep, yeah, we see it, we are okay with it, it's cool, thank you for taking care of yourself, uh, and all that sort of thing. In addition, I was thinking about this the other day, I have a couple of friends who um, ride motorcycles. Uh, hopefully uh, Andy is able to watch today, he was the one that I actually first thought of when I was thinking about this. And um, I don't ride myself, but I, I uh, go up North Michigan a lot, and there are a lot of motorcycle folks up there. Uh, and when we're driving around up there, especially since the roads aren't terribly congested a lot of times, they do this little salute where they, they kind of wave, they, they, they hold their arm, I can't really show it, you know, it's kind of down like this, they have two fingers, three fingers. Um, and I've noticed it really consistently, and I, it seems like it's part of this, this whole kind of uh, motorcycle enthusiast community, because it's a signal that, yeah, we're on the same team. And so I thought, how amazing would that be if we can get that whole COPD community together to recognize that and to all have like our own little salute? Or um, I shouldn't say ours as I'm, I'm an advocate. I'm not. I don't want to jump into that myself. Uh, I don't want to steal that that uh, that that passion. Um, but what if the COPD community could have their own little salute? And so everybody felt like they were part of the club, and it was like, yeah, I, I know what's going on there. So uh, hopefully this thumbs up thing can continue to grow um, continue to encourage people to, again, be taking care of themselves uh, and to, uh, to fight through a lot of the problems we have with oxygen delivery and everything else. 
um, and uh, we can get that uh, um, that support that everybody needs. We go all the way back to the beginning of the show and we're talking about psychosocial support. Everybody needs that. Everybody needs to feel that support. Everybody needs to feel that belonging. Uh, and that's one way that we can help provide that. So um, there's obviously a whole lot more that we could cover with oxygen. We could, um, there are access issues, delivery issues. We didn't really touch on liquid oxygen because that is a great thing that's kind of going away. Uh, Medicare is going through a whole thing right now about uh, how we're going to continue to pay for oxygen here in the States. Uh, again, I encourage you to, to join us on COPD Navigator where we can keep the discussion going. Um, also, a lot of great resources out there if you're having trouble getting oxygen, um, if you're having um, difficulties with your suppliers, uh, the COPD Foundation has some resources set up. You can give them a call to uh, uh, figure out um, or visit their website um, and figure out. There are a lot of advocacy tools, a lot of uh, um, uh, ombudsman tools uh, to help fight through some of the red tape and get exactly what you need. Um, so, like I said, keep the conversation going, uh, but hopefully this kind of gets uh, uh, some of the basics about the hows and whys of oxygen, sheds a little bit light, uh, a little bit of light on how we can do or how we can do better on what things we should be looking for and um, help you a little breathe a little bit easier. So, uh, with that, that wraps up the lesson plan for the day. We're going to jump back into the comments here. Um, well, I left off with Gage. We're back down to David. A um, viewer, uh, Pulse Ox, not familiar with that brand, can be bought for, from CVS. Welcome back, CVS. Um, brought uh, for about $60. That's pretty reasonable. Um, this, uh, you know, again, clinical grade one. I can't remember exactly what the price tag is, but I believe the, the um, um, patient level, consumer level, excuse me, Consumer level equivalent is about that $60 to $80 range. Um, I have another one from another company called uh, Nanin um, that is a little less cool looking. Uh, it's only got a one color, old, older school LCD display. It gives me a little uh, pulse graph, like an old uh, stereo equalizer instead of the nice little waveform. It does the same thing. Um, that one's a little bit cheaper too. Uh, you can get that. Uh, another thing to point out is um, those of you who may have a flexible spending account, Pulse Oxes are devices that can be reimbursed through that. So uh, if you happen to have that still in the workforce and doing that, I uh, want to keep an eye on your um, um, oxygen levels. That could be a, a good avenue for you as well. Uh, David says, mine stays above 95 for the most part, but gets short of breath easily. It's frustrating, but thankful not O2 dependent yet. Um, again, you know, the, the, you can still live a very full, engaged life with oxygen. Of course, it's easier without it, so hopefully we can help um, slow down that progression, make sure that people are uh, living as freely as long as possible. Um, but again, you know, again, important to remember that the sensation of shortness of breath can be caused by hyperinflation, air trapping, get, you know, it's getting stuck in there, which can tell us that it's time for some personal breathing, um, oxygen consumption going up without demand. There, there are so many factors that go into it. Um, it's uh, a low oxygen can influence it, but it is certainly not the only cause. So. Uh, Terry, yes, absolutely. We can get the, the whole recorded program is available on the COPD Navigator Facebook page. Uh, will be available as soon as done. Facebook is done doing all of their processing. Uh, and then um, I have a bit of a backlog right now because, like I said, we had some, some filming disasters and we've had some other stuff going on. Still trying to recover from our various polar vortices over the last couple of weeks uh, and uh, snow days and, and uh, trying to do some some state uh, respiratory society stuff um, these are also going on uh, YouTube you can see the um, yeah, I think I got it right uh, you can see the YouTube link down there we're able finally able to get our own um, URL there so you can go right to that link uh, and see our old episodes of um, TOPD Navigator live you can see uh, the first episode of this year's uh, breathe TV the second one is going to be on its way soon you can also see our episode of uh, the one that we have so far of Spotlight, which focuses on good technique with dry powder inhalers. Uh, we've got another one focusing on meter dose inhalers coming up uh, as soon as I can get some editing time in. Uh, and then we're going to be doing those quick hits. We'll probably convert that uh, um, oxygen train one into a Spotlight. We're going to try to do um, five to ten minute videos that are focused on one thing. Um, so that they're a little bit easier to refer back to. But yes, this is definitely going to be available um, as soon as, again, Facebook, uh, the, the rough cut, so to speak, is uh, as soon as Facebook is done messing around with it. 
Um, so, uh, David, if you have five boxcars that are filled with oxygen, will that still give you a good reading? Yes, absolutely. Again, we go back to uh, if they're completely full, if all your boxcars are full, no matter how many you have, it's still going to give you that reading because it's going to turn the same color. Uh, more or less. I mean, you know, there's going to be that slight wavelength difference, things like that, because of dilution and, and everything else. But um, the sensor is going to pick up that wavelength, and the sensor is going to tell you that number. There are a few um, pulse oximeters, I, actually I believe they are from Massimo, that can do a little bit better job with some of those readings. They can uh, actually non-invasive measure hemoglobin to a certain degree, all hemoglobin to a certain degree, and give you a little bit more of a breakdown. But those are super expensive. Uh, those are really only going to be clinical grade kind of equipment. Um, we're looking at, at maybe getting one for pulmonary function testing. But um, a home unit is not going to be able to do that. Um, no matter if you have one box car, if you got 100 box cars, if it if they're full, then they're full, and you're going to get that number. Susan, greetings from Tucson. Hopefully, you're a little bit warmer than we are today. Uh, Gage, thank you very much. Debbie, first time, welcome in. Hope uh, we do this again every two weeks uh, on Wednesday about noon Eastern time. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you uh, regularly from now on. Uh, David, the pharmacist guaranteed it to be as accurate as the hospitals. You know, there are things out there that, that definitely are equivalent to it. Um, it again, it, it's just, I mean, you can, it's hard to say. And especially as technology progresses, more and more they are the equivalent. Um, it's just, this is one of those things that I, from an ethical standpoint, a clinical standpoint, it's really difficult for me to tell somebody that they can absolutely trust a device that hasn't gone through certifications and things like that. Um, because again, it's like I tell people when I'm teaching them how to use their inhaler. It's really easy to do proper inhaler technique and everything when you're calm, when you're at rest, you can think about the stuff uh, and you do all the steps properly. When you are um, short of breath, if worrying about having an attack and all that stuff, and your circulation is impaired, or you know you're you're shaking and you're getting a lot of that vibration, it's really important to have some of these quality control thing indicators that can at least give you an idea of how much you can trust it. Um, there's not a lot of equipment in the world I put 100% trust in, and it's always nice to know to be able to to qualify a little bit more how much I can put into it. So this is not to say that um, a $20 oximeter or $50 or a $30 oximeter is never going to work or is terrible. You shouldn't buy it. Um, if that's what you got, then, you know, that that's, that's fine. Uh, it may work perfectly well, but then again, it may not. We've got, you know, not only do we talk about signal issues, but quality control and manufacturing issues, you know, all that stuff costs money too. So it's just, it's a buyer beware situation. That's all. I, I, that, that's really what it comes down to. Um, but thank you uh, for the, the photo confidence there. Appreciate it. Uh, Susan, that's right. You did just move there from Mason. We've talked about uh, Susan is a member of the group. I knew I recognized your name. Couldn't remember exactly what the context is. You got out just in time. <laughs> um, in the 50s today, uh in the 50s with chances of snow in the evening maybe all right um yeah we have uh lansing area has been just about as hard hit as uh, kalamazoo grand rapids um are throughout the state i, I was just reading an article because they're, they're actually looking at legislation right now in our state government um to uh relax some of our snow day policies for the state because um a huge number if not quite a majority of um schools uh, throughout the state um, have exceeded their their man their legally allowed snow day allotment i think you can have six or something like that i know uh here in southwest michigan we've got places 10 12 14 snow days um it's affecting everybody our local um respiratory care program our, our training program has missed a, a lot, something like half of their clinical days this semester um so it's been a huge huge issue um operationally and then of course the, the clinical effects of it uh, people have been just uh, the cold air is dry air and it's been triggering triggering exacerbations and it, it's just been it's been a heck of a month so um you did definitely get out just in time glad you're enjoying a little bit more moderate weather a little bit more temperate weather uh and hopefully um finding that good balance between too dry 
uh, and too humid too. So um, thank you everybody else for joining today. We've got a couple of minutes left um, to have, uh, if anybody wants to get any last minute questions in, certainly willing to take that. Can be on oxygen, can be on uh, weather conditions, can be on whatever is on your mind as far as the, the COPD, chronic lung disease world is going uh, before we sign off here. Arizona about to have a snowpocalypse tonight. Uh, that is definitely the word of the year. Um, I think back to a map I saw when we were in the midst of all this, the first week of February, uh, and um, the satellite had basically, uh, the entire state of Michigan was covered in snow. And so there were a lot of jokes about that feeling when you lose your mitten in the snow or, you know, come look for us because we're on, not on the map anymore. Um, it has been, uh, it has certainly been a year, certainly been a, uh, snow a snowpocalypse type event. Um, but hopefully we're on the way out of that. Um, again, we're having a little bit of winter weather today, but hopefully we're going to start tailing off of that as we start getting into uh, late February, early March, and uh, looking ahead to spring where it would be just the time for pollen stuff to come about. Uh, so again, uh, last minute questions. Anybody out there want to throw anything out? Um, otherwise, we're going to start wrapping things up. Just taking a look real quick because I always forget to write down what we're going to be talking about in two weeks. Um, so if I can pull that up real quick. Um, again, we do this every two weeks. I hope to have a, actually a couple episodes of Spotlight by, out by then. We'll talk about um, um, the meter dose inhalers and all that kind of stuff. If you have any suggestions for a live topic um, or a, a shorter, uh, the breakout sessions in the uh, in the um, the spotlight series, uh, please drop them in the comments. Whether it's um, whether it's on the the side of the screen or below or wherever it is that you're watching this, uh, drop us a comment. Uh, subscribe to our page here on Facebook. Join our group here on Facebook, both of which are called COPD Navigator. Uh, one of them's got the uh, nice little lighthouse icon. One of them um, on my app has a little sunflower. And then when you get into the group, it's got a picture of a lighthouse. Uh, the uh, uh, Whiskey Point Lighthouse on uh, Beaver Island, Michigan, as a matter of fact. Um, in two weeks, we are going to be talking about some exercises you can do. Uh, we talked a little bit about pulmonary rehab at the top of the program. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more insight about what that app does and, and things like that. But uh, regardless, some things that you can do even in the privacy of your own home uh, to get uh, a little bit better, breathing a little bit better, to stay breathing better, and to uh, take care of that symptom burden for you. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of other questions come around. I've got a couple of other spots where they might pop up. So let me just briefly um, check out a couple other spots. Uh, all right, it looks like it has Facebook finally consolidated all of their comments. Could it be? Uh, but it doesn't look like we got a lot of other questions coming through. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get ready and sign up. Oh, we do have one. We've got uh, we've got a couple here. So going back. Or, nope, that's a different one. Sorry. Different posts. So we actually, yeah, we're good to go. So. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, at some point, I will figure out how to collect all of the different Facebook comments into one spot so I can just monitor monitor them a little bit easier. Um, until then, uh, please join us again in two weeks on uh, uh, March 6th, I believe it is. Um, now I might have to adjust the uh, the schedule a little bit. Might have to come at 1 o'clock on that one, so stay tuned for some updates. Uh, I'm going to be giving a lecture to some of our medical students and some of our residents that day, so I just need to double-check that timing. Uh, but otherwise, be sure to check with us uh, every other Wednesday here in COPD Navigator for Breathe TV. Uh, again, my name is Mike Hess. I look forward to seeing everybody uh, in a couple of weeks or around the Facebook and YouTube world. Um, please feel free to reach out. Any comments, suggestions, complaints, um, anything else we can do to make the, uh, the experience and the show better. Um, until then, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and uh, see, you in, uh, see you next time.